I was always picked last for like dodgeball in school. Always. I was always like, the boys were like, mm, she's so girly, she's gonna ruin it. You know, I was always that reputation. So when I started getting these like action tough girl roles, it was really like, I don't know, it really meant a lot to me that, that somebody out there who hadn't seen that version of me saw me in this way. Hello everyone, welcome back for a brand new episode of Collider Ladies Night. I am very happy right now because I am sitting across from, wait for it, for the star of Final Destination 3. <laughs> Everybody out there knows that I am obsessed with that franchise, really? so I had to mention it at some Hello. point, but no, we have one of the stars of Gemini Man here, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Thank you so much for visiting us Thank today. You for me. I think I know why he's as good as you. He is you. You made a person out of another person. Then you sent me to kill him. You made a choice to do this to me. This thing that you are struggling with is fear. It has been quite a while since our last chat. Yes. We were talking about uh, faults at South by Southwest a while ago. Years ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, four or five I, years ago. I feel like this is like a big step up from, I think I had uh, like a little flip camera on a, oh, on a baby tripod in, in a lobby at a hotel I remember this. somewhere. Yes, yeah. I do remember this. I'm glad it made an impression. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to talk a little bit about Gemini Man, but also we want everyone to get to know you as well. And the first thing I wanted to ask you was, did you always know you wanted to grow up and be an actor or a performer, or was there ever a point in your life when you said, like, I don't know, I want to grow up and be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that? You no, know, I can remember being like 10 and being like, I'm going to be an actor slash doctor, you know, like one of those really far-fetched 10-year-old ideas of what being an adult is. You but should play a doctor. Yes, there you go. See, best of both worlds. Um, but I always kind of knew I would be a performer from as long as I can remember. Um, I think I thought, I, I, I had it in my head that that I also wanted to like go to Harvard and I wanted to get a degree in something else because I wanted to be well-rounded. I had all these like thoughts of what you should be or what you should do and, and in my mind just being an actor was somehow not serious enough of a thing to aspire to be. Huh. I think because I came from a family of like mostly academics and like my sister's a doctor and my brother's an engineer and so I was a little bit like, okay, I've got to have something else to go with this. But that as I got older, it was so clear that this was all I was interested in <laughs> that mm -hmm. I ended up, I didn't even go to college. I barely went to high school. Do you so. remember what maybe the project or the specific moment that changed that mentality for you? Because I know there's tons of people out there. I want to grow up and I want to be, you know, something yeah. like yeah. in the film industry. But I mean, even with what I do, it, it didn't really feel real. I didn't feel like yes. I could be a film critic until it became an actual profession for me. I think it's, you know, for me, it's it took being able to prove that I could do it on my own two feet as an adult. Like I started acting really young. I was 12 when I got my first like professional job and I worked, you know, pretty steadily from that point on up until I was like 18. And then around the time I was 18, I sort of struggled for a little bit to kind of find more work and to find the right job and to sort of figure out who I was going to be as an actor. I was, I was, I was having trouble trusting that I was going to work as a career like as an adult and that was like a big fear of failure for me because I was like I just you know you just think you know you've got to be successful at whatever yeah. you do and acting is a really scary thing because you just don't you just don't know and I got I got lucky that I I, I think it took me like a year it was like 18 to 19 I didn't work at all and that was like I was like do I go to college do I just give up what do I do and then when I was 19, I got this movie Sky High, which was like this Disney I do remember kids that. movie. And that was like, okay, you did it. And then after that, I never, I never really went very long without working. So I just, I got very lucky. And a very special thank you goes to our guests of honor and the recipients of our first ever Hero of the Year Award, the Commander and Jetstream. <laughs> You mentioned uh, finding the right thing too, and this is a little bit of a convoluted question, so forgive me, but that's another thing that I always wonder about, because especially when you're first starting out, I imagine it's like, like give me, you don't want to say no to something, give me yeah. all the opportunities, yeah. but at the same time, you want to craft a specific path that's right for you, so what was it like early on trying to balance that mentality? Yeah, I mean, I think I had very clear ideas of who I was and, and who I wanted to be as an actor, and I didn't always kind of know how to get there or, or quite understand all the scripts that I was being given. I can look back now and think, oh, you got that amazing indie script that like was awesome, but in my young mind, I was like, oh, I don't like there's a sex scene in there. I'm mm, no, you know, there were like things that I had that were really important at the time that are less important to me now, but that's just a part of who you are and who you're growing into and sort of going through those phases were, were really important. Um, 
And everywhere that I was in my career was really representative, I think, of, of who I was and what I was going after, even if it was like a film like Final Destination 3. Like, it was really, she was a really strong, level-headed character. And for me, as like a 20-year-old girl, I really wanted to represent that rather than, you know, the flip side of a horror movie where it's like, you're in a skimpy, skimpy clothes and you're running around screaming. You know, that, at that point in my life, I, was, I really wanted to be taken seriously. So even though I was doing a horror movie, it was important for me that it was that kind of a character in a horror movie. Get out! Get out! What? what? Oh, yes! There's no one in the truck! Watching your footsteps. Big part of the reason why I'm such a huge fan of, fan of that franchise. I feel like the leads in that one, right. something about them always spoke to me growing up more so than oh, that's a nice. lot of other horror yeah, franchises. Yeah, yeah, there's a certain kind of inner strength in there or something. I would say so. Nice. Yeah. Two-fold question for you right now, because you mentioned maybe passing on certain scripts that you weren't ready for or didn't appeal yeah, to you back yeah. in the day. Are any of those scripts actually, were they made into movies now that maybe you wish you had been a part of now as an adult? And also, is there anything you made when you were younger that now as an adult you look back on more fondly than maybe when you first did it? You know, I can remember passing on the audition for Mean Girls. And I remember it was partially because like my mom was really, when I was younger, was really involved in my career. And so we'd both read scripts and like sometimes she would be like, Ugh, that's terrible. You know, like this, the humor is like raunchy or whatever. And so she like hated that script and was like, you're not auditioning for that. And I just was sort of like, oh, okay, whatever. I didn't really think for the much Katie about role? it. Definitely not for that role. It was like one of the, it was like the Lacey Chabert's role oh, or something like that. Gretchen. You know? Gretchen. Yeah. It was for something With like that. With the gold tube Yeah. And I like, I remember just sort of going, yeah, this is probably not going to be anything. It's just like a stupid <laughs> comedy. Like what, you know, so there's things like that that I just didn't really I wasn't plugged into enough you know I was looking for great roles to mm -hmm. play when I first started as opposed to really looking at the whole story of the film and what the film was saying and what the whole arc was because um, I just wanted to act and just wanted to like get a great role to play so that's one thing as I've gotten older that's like okay it's not just about your character in the movie it's about the whole thing mm -hmm. and everyone who's involved and what the story is and Every, every piece of it is just as important as your piece of it. But that was, you know, I was a teenager, so it took me a little while. To and are there out. any of those earlier roles that maybe at the time you're like, this isn't exactly what I wanted, but yeah. now that you have grown into the career well beyond that, you can look back on it and say, no, that, that really had something special to it. Of things that I actually did, that yeah. I did end up doing, you know, um, I did a lot of not great work in my, in my early days that I thought was great at the time. Um, I can show you some of my early reviews. It'll make you yes, feel better about yes, that. Yes, <laughs> yes, right. I don't know. I mean, everything had its place for me. Um, everything sort of took me to where I needed to go in terms of growing as a person in some mm -hmm. way or growing as an actor in some way. Even the ones that were not great sort of helped me figure out where I wanted to go towards and what I wanted to move away from. So. Honestly, everything was, was really meaningful in its own way for that reason. I like being able to look at it that way. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> uh, going back again, because, you know, I'm busy reading your Wikipedia page to prep for all this, and one thing caught my eye that you were a ballet dancer. Yes. And that you stopped because you were too tall. So I'm yes. just wondering what it's like going through something like that where you have the mentality of, like, I'm super passionate about this, but there's something I can't control that's stopping me from yeah. doing it. And that, I don't know, that just sounds so upsetting. So I'm curious to know what it was like going through that. Yeah, I mean, I think I was able to sort of numb it out a little bit because I, I was starting to act. And so I just went on to that and I tried not to really think about, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that the dancing thing wasn't going to work out for me. Um, you know, I definitely had that, like, I went from being like a 12 year old kid who was perfect for the ballet world to by the time I was 14 and I sort of like woke up one day and I had hips and I was really tall and I was just like my body was totally different and so you could just feel no I don't remember anybody outright saying to me like you're never gonna make it because mm -hmm. you're too tall and you're but but like the I could see by the way people were looking at me it was like suddenly like all my teachers were like disappointed and it was like it was just crushing as a kid to just walk into a room yeah. and just have everybody go Oh, you know, you could just see it. So I didn't really want to be in that environment anymore. I dealt with it a little bit in the acting world mm -hmm. as well. So it wasn't like I completely got away from it, but at least with acting, I, I could trust that this was someplace I could continue. I could push forward. I could keep acting through the years and I, I wouldn't end up having to sort of, you know, sit back at the age of 30 or, yeah. or whatever it would be for, for a dancer. To flip that around a little, is there anything that you thought, I can never do this, even in acting earlier on, that you wound up accomplishing? Um, um, that I, I mean, 
Oh gosh, so like many a certain yeah. type of role. Yeah. Maybe maybe some that you've done so much stunt work now, and you've yes. got something really cool coming up. Yes, no, definitely. I mean, stunts. I think probably as I when I was a kid, because I was a ballet dancer, there was mm -hmm. always this association with me being really girly. Like in a, you know, like I was always picked last for like dodgeball in school. Always, I was always like the boys were like, mm, she's so girly, she's gonna ruin it. You know, I was always that reputation. So when I started getting these like action tough girl roles, it was really like, I don't know, it really meant a lot to me that, that somebody out there who hadn't seen that version of me saw me in this way. Now I want to see you play a doctor, but also like we got to find you like a biopic about a pro athlete or something. I know, something. seriously. If you no. were to learn any specific, like even a, a sport or a profession for a movie, for a role, what would it be? Oh my God. Um... I don't know why it just popped into my head, but I, I used to, I, for a little time, I rode horses when I was a kid, oh. and, I, and I got thrown off, and I didn't really ever continue with it. Um, and I don't know why that was the first thing that popped into my head, but I'd love to like, you know, get to know working with horses oh. again. That Have you seen really the movie nice. The Mustang this year? No, but I've heard about it. I'd love to Go see it. Go see it. It's something yeah. else. It's, that is a beautiful, beautiful yeah. movie. Um, I'm also, I was telling you before, I'm like a little like OCD and I'm obsessed with the idea of preset rituals, just things you have to do before you get ready to shoot a scene or something you need to have in your hand when you go to set. So is right. there anything like that for you on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, a ritual. Um, oh gosh. I mean, I think for me, I'm always like, I'm, I'm always somebody that has the sides in my hand when we're rehearsing. Mm -hmm. And like, like you said, we were talking earlier about security blankets, like I almost never need to look at them, but I always want to have them close by or have them in my hand or have, you know, um, just because you'd hate to be in that moment where you're drawing a blank and like, and then you're going, wait, wait, what's happening? I yeah. I'm lost. I so can't. it's almost never, you almost never really need it. Um, but other than that, I don't know. I don't have a lot of rituals. What do you do when you're working with someone else and they have that moment? Um, you know, you just try to power through it and you try to um, not be judgmental about it because it's all it's happened to all of us mm -hmm. um, and you know that the other person is dying on the inside like I've almost never had an experience where somebody forgets a line or gets lost in a scene and and doesn't care and it's like whatever you know it's like deeply shattering when it happens so you just want to like just be like it's okay yeah breathe we're just gonna work we're just gonna go through it and just stay calm and wait until it's over. <laughs> that's probably the nice way to approach it. I feel like that's the only way to make it better. Anything, yes. anything the opposite, You're just gonna make it worse. it's no good for everybody. Yeah. Do you have any onset vices like I, coffee or Diet Coke yeah, or like that? Yeah, both. I mean, I try to stay away from the Diet Coke, but I never buy it at home. So that's one of those things when you're on set, there's all these things that you don't, normally yeah. don't allow yourself to have that are just everywhere. So Diet Coke, um, fruit snacks, that's a good um, one. like goldfish crackers. Those tend to be the things that like, when I walk by the craft service table, I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> and then I end up taking something. I'm yeah, not I feel like that's appropriate too, because it's not it's not like too heavy that yeah. it's gonna drag you it's down. Like this a little pick me up. The know? one movie I made, I got in the habit of our, uh, our crafty would make this gigantic pan of like super rich, it was like date bread, which has like a chocolatey Ooh, flavor to oh it. And I have a God. major sweet tooth. That's so every deadly. time I walk past it, was, yeah, yeah oh, it's like no. food coma And when they day. make stuff too, it feels impolite. Now, that's how I always am. I'm like, I've got to be polite. They just made this. It's so true. I've got to eat it and, and appreciate it. I like work. using that as yeah. an excuse. <laughs> so recently we did a Collider Spotlight piece with Kelvin Harrison Jr. And he stars in Loose. He's phenomenal. Great. He was telling me that he has gotten into the habit of watching interviews with other individuals. And he's yeah. busy referencing all these great comments that they made that he's put in his back pocket. Wow. So I asked him, if you could ask anybody else out there during one of these interviews a question of your own, what would it be? So I've got one question from him to you right now. Okay. He told me, I would love to hear actors talk more about how they balance the relationship between directors and co-stars and also how to be a lead. That's a really great question. Um, you know, I've actually been in that situation where a director doesn't get along with one of the other actors and you feel a little bit stuck, like keeping the peace kind of a, kind of a thing, which mm -hmm. um, is a hard place to be because in that situation, both people were great. I liked both people for whatever reason, they butted heads. So trying not to take sides with anybody, trying to just like be there for anybody who, who needs you. And that's also part of, I think, in this situation, I wasn't the lead, but but speaking about being a lead, um, 
for me, I've always tried to do that is to try and be there for everybody who might be stressed out or might be especially actors who maybe have a smaller role or haven't done as much. I've been there before, so I can kind of see it when somebody is a little bit like deer in the headlights. Um, and I really enjoy that. I've always really enjoyed sort of like um, helping out mm -hmm. somebody who maybe wants advice or something. It's kind of nice to feel like, oh, I can actually pass something down to this person, you know? So I like, I like that and I, and I am happy when I'm on a set where the lead is, is doing that for me or for, for other people. It, it's sort of, it's a really lovely thing to see. Um, I didn't really touch as much on the actors, directors with, or uh, um, relationship yeah, with directors. Yeah, but, directors and uh, co-stars. And co-stars, did he mean? I think he meant because in, so in Loose, he's the title character, yeah. but he's got people like Octavia Spencer and yes. Naomi Watts around right, him. So it's this right. idea of, you know, being the commanding lead, that yes. leading force on set, yes. but also working as also an ensemble. Also being able to be a part of the ensemble. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like being the, the rock, ultimately, I think is what you what you hope to be and, and what works the best. You know, mm -hmm. the worst is when, and I'm sure it's not like this in his situation, but in some situations when you have someone who's somewhat volatile or somewhat, you know, unpredictable as the lead. It's just, it really keeps everybody on edge all the time. Um, and it's really, it's not where you want to be. So you kind of need to be, and Will Smith is the perfect example of this. Like he is a rock of positivity and strength and like, just like Zen, you know, and that's how the whole experience around him feels. It's, it really carries carries on through everybody. Okay, I've thought of three follow-up questions. Now let's see if I can hit all three of them. First one, you were describing before about someone who is a good lead and almost like that feeling of taking someone, you know, taking one individual under their wing. Is there anybody over the course of your career that made that kind of impression on you that really stuck with you? You know, um, I, I know I've, I've already just said Will Smith, but he, you know, he, he, he doesn't do it in a way that's like super in your face, like you've got to be like me, but he sort of leads by example in a really wonderful way and um, just makes everybody feel really happy to be at work and feel really valued and, and you know, I think that's, that's what you hope to be like and mm -hmm. never loses his cool. He's just like, he shows up and you just get the sense that he's just grateful to be there every day. And that's like, that's a really great thing to, to take with you to the next project for everybody who was involved. Love hearing about that. Yeah. When it's like someone like him too. Totally. It's like all yeah. these opportunities and it's so nice to hear that it doesn't take him for granted yeah. and he, he has like a good effect on everybody yeah. around him. Absolutely. I have forgotten question two, but I'm glad you brought Will up again because yeah. that paves the way to three yeah. at least. What are the technical challenges for you of working with two Will Smiths in Gemini Man? Well, there were there were a few interesting aspects to it. I mean, one just, you know, I'm sure you've talked to people who've done motion capture work. And so that was my first time doing that. So it was interesting. Every time I was in a scene with both versions of Will Smith in the film, um, we would shoot the scene in a very complicated way. We'd have to shoot it so many different ways. You know, it would be with Will and his double, it would be with Will and Will, <laughs> it would be with Will and nothing, you know, it would be like, it was just all these different versions. And then at the end of the movie, at the end of the schedule, we went into this motion capture studio and we redid all of those scenes, every single one, over again. So, so it was like, it was just a lot of, of work on the, the same scene in, in various, various ways. I have a million questions about that process. So you're basically doing a lot of the material two times over. Yeah. So going into it the second time, do you have to re-watch exactly what you did and put like the same, you know, uh, intonation on a certain line? It's a strange process. So all that matters in the motion capture part of it, at least for our film, was was Will's performance. So I was there to, to recreate the scene for him so that it was real, but I wasn't on camera at all like I could literally be in my pajamas it, it didn't matter and what they did was they would play a TV with the scene so that we knew exactly the pattern of our speech and exactly how it went and we'd have to match it like we literally be like I'd be speaking along with myself like looking at Will speaking like kind of like an ADR where you're mm -hmm. matching exactly you know the sound so it was just a very odd like in my peripheral vision I could see myself speaking and then I was trying to act the scene with him as it was playing next to me it's like a really sort of <laughs> surreal thing so seeing everything that he went through to see a film like this through to fruition would you yeah. ever want to get into that end of performance capture you know I absolutely would be up for the challenge but it it's got to be hard I always felt I felt for him because it was like he's doing these intense scenes in this absolutely ridiculous 
arena. I mean, it was like, you know, golf balls everywhere and he's covered in balls and he's in a gray unitard suit and trying to, and with dots all over his face, trying to emote, you know, and I'm just like, oh God, this must be so hard. That makes me think of, so we play a game here called Would You Rather and it's all like movie and TV based questions. Yeah. So it makes me think to ask you this one, would you rather do motion capture or have to wear a ton of prosthetics? Um, I think wear a ton of prosthetics, I think. I think it would be easier to still feel like I was really in the moment, you know, as long as I was in like a real space <laughs> with like real people, even if I was under a bunch of stuff. In some ways, wearing a bunch of prosthetics could be nice because you could sort of, hot, you're sort of hidden under there. So yeah. it's almost like you could be really real because you don't have to worry about what's happening. I the like outside. the excitement of that. I have one traumatizing experience where it was it was zombie makeup and mm. I have a fear of the dentist and they painted tooth rot on my teeth oh. and it was just like I know all of that out. takes a lot of time to get off in general but the fact that the tooth rot took so long to come off I like you were worried I, it was, was never going to come I off. I was freaking out yeah. that it wasn't going to come off, yeah. that God forbid I would have to go see the dentist. Right. Oh, oh I can't. No. I can't. Yes, yes, that's uh, scary. So I also obviously have to ask about working with Ang Lee, and specifically the fact, one thing that fascinates me about him as a filmmaker is the fact that so many of his movies are completely different, whereas mm. there are certain other filmmakers out there that I know they've got like a certain style or tell a certain type of story. So when you go into a film working with a director like Ang Lee, is there anything you could do in order to prepare for that experience? You know, he's just such a lovely and very specific person, you know, and in, in, in terms of what he wants to get across and how he wants it to be achieved. So you really just kind of follow his lead. I mean, I think ultimately what he's trying to do in every facet of, of all the different styles and all the different you know types of films that he does is he's really just trying to get at what's most truthful, like something that's really truthful mm -hmm. and trying to do it in totally different ways. Like he's done it in Brokeback Mountain in one way, you know, and now he's taking this, pushing the limits of technology to also serve that purpose. I think he's really trying to just sort of capture the soul of, of the person who's in front of the camera. And I think he's trying to do that with this 3D technology that make, really makes you feel like you're there with somebody. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is a really big question, but I kind of want to ask it, given <laughs> all the incredible people you've worked with, do you see kind of, I don't know, maybe like a shared trait in the greats, especially having brought up Will Smith, Ang mm -hmm. Lee, and everybody else you've worked with. Is there like some sort of consistency that you see there? You know, I would say it's um, a strength of, of who they are and kind of knowing knowing who they are. And so there's no there's no question in terms of, should I do this? Should I do that? You, you don't ever see that in, in any of them. I mean, Aang could get like stressed out sometimes, you know, in trying to achieve his vision, but he always knew what it was. You know, there was no waffling. And the same with like Quentin Tarantino and Will Smith and anyone like that. They're just so solid in their own sense of self which I think is really amazing. I'm so curious, what is it like when Ang Lee gets stressed out? Like, I can't, I can't even picture it's it. It's kind of great. It's kind of, I just love him. I just really love, I just think he's, I think everything about him is so endearing. So sometimes he would get, you know, it'd be long hours and we're doing this crazy, really stuff that hasn't been done in film before. And like, he's really trying to push, push these new, these new limits of technology. And so there'd be days where he'd just be like pulling his hair out, but he was always like the next day, he'd come out and he'd be like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I got stressed out. And it's like, it's okay, Aang, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> He's just so sweet that, you know, some directors, they might get angry or, you know, might yeah. lash out and like, you don't get an apology from them. Like if he ever got a little stressed, he would be so, he'd be so wounded in feeling like he might've, your feelings or something so he's just he's just totally lovely and when the stress is handled that way I always think it's good th it's a good thing for someone to get stressed because it means they care yes and he if cares they don't so have much. that maybe you should work somewhere else he's so passionate about wanting wanting this to come to light this sort of these new ideas that he has mm -hmm. and I think it's really wonderful so we are of course sitting on the set of Collider ladies night so I do have to ask about birds of prey I know the rules no specifics but I yes. do really want to know what it's like working on the set of a film where you were working entirely with a female ensemble with a director like Kathy at the helm. Can you feel the difference on a set like that? It was so much fun. And yeah, you totally can. I mean, it was just so easy. There was no ego in any of it. I mean, not to say that ego is a male only trait. It's certainly not. But in this case, it was just so easy. Everybody just wanted to be there, wanted to be with each other, wanted to be playing these roles. Um, and it was exciting. It was exciting. Like everything about it was so cool. Like the costumes and, and Kathy like really being at the helm of it. And 
really making these decisions like that she thought were cool as opposed to going, well, we got to appeal mm -hmm. to this person, we got to appeal to that person, we got to, it was really like she had the reins and like Margot was super involved in a collaborative way, but it was all just like, what do we think is cool? Like not how we, not, not like, but our guy's going to think this is sexy or is that, you know, the, we didn't have any of those questions. Mm -hmm. It was just like, what do we think is cool? So you know? one question that I find myself asking quite a bit now is to name somebody that you think is changing the industry for the better. And one of the names I go to often is Margot Robbie because yeah. I just love seeing people who maybe hit a big through a particular role, but then they swing that weight around in order to get yeah. projects made a way they might not have been made before. Yeah. So what is it like working with her and how hands-on is she on a daily basis? Now? Yeah, I would say her as well. I think it's so important for people that have a platform like her to be making the kinds of choices that she's making and to be making sure that she works with women and people of, of all different ethnicities and backgrounds and and being able to say, oh, I have the opportunity to get films made now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that to make sure people have a voice who didn't have it before. I think she's absolutely going down that road. And also is just making smart choices in terms of making good films and, and picking talented people to, to sort of um, share her time with. So I think she's on an amazing track and I and I hope more people follow suit. I think the more names we can add to the answer of that question the better. So yes. is there anybody else that comes to mind that you would um, want to give that title to? Gosh, there's so many people yeah. right now. You're um, not restricted to just one. I know. I'm like trying to think of, I'm mainly just thinking of people that I've worked with who I admire. Yeah. Like Rosario Dawson I admire a lot for the the work that she does. Um, I mean I uh, yeah, I, there's so many, there's so many. I'm sort of drawing a blank, but I. What about someone like even, for example, on the set of uh, Gemini Man? Who is someone on that set, whether it's a co-star or you know, like a PA, someone who made a difference during a day when you were having a tough day? Yeah, that's an easy answer. My stunt double Haley, who's been now, she's my stunt double on Gemini Man and Birds of Prey, and now she's um, going to be my stunt double on my next film, and. Um, she, along with the whole stunt team, are just the most supportive, positive people, and she would always be there, basically. And it's not her job to be my cheerleader, but she she always would be. She would just be like on set, nearby, like, do you need anything? Like, you did so good, you're, you're doing awesome. Just always, and there were definitely times on Gemini Man where I felt like I just screwed that up. Like, we had this big, long one where I had to like reload a gun, and I was like, all these guys falling from rooftops, and it was just like, oh my God, like you're really in a firefight. And I just was like, I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't good, I wasn't on it. And she just was like, so like, you're doing amazing. She calmed me down and, and really talked me through it. And I was so, so appreciative of her. definitely someone you want to keep working with. Yes, yeah, she's amazing. So as we have to wind down here, we love wrapping things up with Collider Random Questions. And I've got no list here. I'm just going to say whatever comes to my mind first. What is the most spontaneous thing you've done recently? Um, I've, my life is pretty spontaneous. Um, I s did a road trip this summer through New England, which was really great, and stayed in a different town every night and didn't plan it or anything. Um, and then spent three weeks in a little tiny town in Maine and just, again, no plans, just sort of like found a place to stay. Oh my God, I have such a rigid weeks. schedule. I envy <laughs> I you so much. I know, it was very lucky. I, I mean, I had to do it because I just sort of have this little window of time between projects. So it was sort of like, just go and do nothing for a little bit, but it was really great. What is your biggest fear? Um, biggest fear. It's a really, it's a deep. It's a, it, well, it, it doesn't have to be deep. Like I'm terrified of the dentist and bees and yes. both are ridiculous. Yes, yes. I mean, I guess, I don't, I, I guess I'm a, I'm kind of afraid of heights. I'm a bit oh, of a, okay. heights are probably, of all those kind of phobias, heights are the only thing that really, like when I see somebody rock climbing on TV or something, I get physically ill. Okay, <laughs> so I guess you didn't watch Free Solo last year. No, that movie. I heard it was great. Oh my God, it's not see it. phenomenal. Yeah. And the visuals, like, yeah, you yeah. can't really shake that. You could feel like yeah. you're up there with Like my them, palms so. will get sweaty just watching it. All right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe just don't see that, but yeah. continue to recommend yeah. it to other yeah. people great. because great. it is great. Good if to know. you got the opportunity to revisit it, any of your past roles in a sequel, prequel, you name it, what would it be and why? Um, huh, you know, maybe it would be Ramona Flowers. I think it would be interesting to see like where she is 10 years later. I like, would be totally open to that. As a character. Like, I, I, I just think that would be an interesting exploration. Uh, Scott Pilgrim? So do you want to go out sometime? 
Um, no, that's okay. You just need to sign for this, all right? Yeah. Have you ever just envisioned that, especially while you were making a movie like yeah. that? Do you ever think about, you know, where would she be right after the story wraps up? You know up? what? I'm kind of thinking about it for the first time right now. I mean, we definitely talked about, ooh, there should be a sequel. You know, all that stuff was talked about for years, but you just think of it as, like, what's happening the next day, not what's happening in 10 years. So I think for all of those characters, they're such, you know, specifically mid-20s, slackers, you know? So like, where are they now? I think that would be really interesting. I love the sound of that. I would yeah. see a sequel to that movie in a heartbeat. Yeah. I wish we could make that happen now. <laughs> do you have any pets? I do. I have a little <gasps> dog okay. named Ambrosius. <laughs> and that's why I'm making a sad face because she had, I had to give, give her to my sister for the next several months because I'm going to be away working. At least she's so. with family. Yes, I know, but it breaks my heart. My cat has a cat sitter. That I'm like the only person in the world with a cat sitter that comes and visits him two times a day wow. every time I go to a film festival. That is, that's love. Dewey is a king and I live to serve him. <laughs> that's very sweet. That is all the time we have. I have a million more questions. Oh, but well, thank you so until, much. Until next time, you are obviously extremely busy, so I'm sure we will have you in for another movie, TV show, you name it, sometime soon. Or music. Yeah, music now, knows? right? That was who another knows? thing that I looked up that I didn't get to ask we'll you see. about. Um, well, where can everybody hear your music then? You know what? I honestly don't even know. I, <laughs> at one point it was on iTunes. I don't know if it still is, but but YouTube, maybe? Yeah. I feel like that's an appropriate <laughs> place to search for sure. something. And you're yeah. already here yeah. if you're watching this interview. Yes. So guys, Gemini Man hits theaters October 11th. Check it out. Thank you so much for being here Thank today. Thank you so Again, much. Thank you guys for watching this edition of Collider Ladies Night. Do not leave without like and sharing this interview. And guess what? We're going to see you soon with more episodes.